today because today is a very special Sunday for us. It's the Sunday that we take the service time where we would normally be preaching and give you a chance to ask whatever questions you might have about the Christian life, about the Bible, about Christian doctrine. All of that is uh, open. There's no plants. There's no prescripted uh, questions out there. You don't text in your question. You don't write your question down. Um, we are going to just have you grab a microphone and ask whatever question you have. It's going to be a fun morning. It always is. We like to know what's on your mind. Sometimes my sermons answer questions you're not asking. So we want to answer some questions that you are asking. And I got two microphone brokers up here, and they're going to find you when you, ra- when you wave them down, and we'll get started. We'll dive right in. And while one is being asked, you can wave down the other one, and we'll just go back and forth. So let's get started. Here we go. So wave, wave these guys down. Start right here. Second row. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, excellent opportunity. I love it. Uh, my question is, uh, we can praise Lord, we can love Lord. Why most of us have trouble 100% of the time trusting Lord? Yeah. Yeah. And the question is, how do we do that more? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, we're not going to trust someone we don't know well, right? I mean, it's hard for us to trust strangers. So I think the goal of learning to trust God is learning his track record and his character. So I would say more Bible study. That's a pretty simple answer from a pastor on a Sunday morning. But uh, what we really need is to know the Lord better. We know the Lord by the self-disclosure that he gives us in his word. Some of us think that we're biblically literate because we read the Bible. We need to go further than that. We need to study the Bible, which means we're taking time on a small section of Scripture. We're unpacking that in its original context. We're trying to principalize the text by drawing out eternal truths, and then we're we're seeking to apply it. So that's going from reading to study, and then from study to memorizing the Scripture and meditating on the Scripture, which means that we're taking it on our mind and cogitating on it while the music's off, while the phone is not ringing, and and those kinds of things, just getting that into our lives by having a reading, study, memorizing, and meditating practice of the Bible, we get to know the Bible better. So just because you read the Bible or you go through the, the daily Bible reading doesn't necessarily mean you're learning uh, what it is to know and, 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 and know the trustworthiness of God. We get to know him uh, even experientially by knowing his words. So um, more Bible study, teach you to trust the Lord better. Okay, back here. Good morning, Pastor Mike. Good morning. I got a question about my um, daughter's school. She attends a Christian school, and they believe in teaching the kids confirmation. And I don't know much about that, so I wanted to ask you, is it okay for my daughter to go through the ritualistic ceremony of confirmation even though she doesn't know what she's doing and it's just more like yeah. a ceremony to her? This is a Catholic school, I assume. No, it's Lutheran. Lutheran school, okay. One step removed, but a good step in the right direction, so that's good. <laughs> um, and my answer would be no. It's not okay. I've never had my kid involved in something, spiritually, that is, that um, is, is a ritual that they're not engaged in. Now, I'll get them what we call in, the, in line with the means of grace. In other words, I'm all about them being under, sitting under preaching. I'm, I'm all into them bowing their heads and concentrating on my words when I'm praying. But if they are not connecting with the truth that are trying to be uh, expressed in this Lutheran confirmation, then I would say, no, I don't want them to be involved in it. And then I would say, secondarily, how the Lutherans view confirmation would not be how I would view conversion. Therefore, I would say, I'm not even interested in the, in the ritual. I mean, there are rituals, I understand, if you want to call them that. There are ordinances that you go through, like baptism and the Lord's Supper, that are biblically uh, directed. And I would say, yeah, I don't want my kids involved in any of those without a full understanding of what they're doing, which would be at least commensurate with what you're asking. Uh, but I would say, yeah, I would, not, I would not have my kid participate. You're asking me, Mike Fabars, would not have my kid participating in a confirmation at a Lutheran school. Uh, I, I just wouldn't do it. That's my answer. Yeah. Lutherans are mad at me now, but that's, that's my answer. Yeah. Hi, Pastor. Um, this question is more about election versus free will, like the Arminianism versus Calvinism. So James, we learned that faith without works is dead. Ephesians, we learned that we're saved by faith, you know, um, not by ourselves, the gift of God, you know, so no one could boast. So is it possible 
my question is, that, is it possible that my reverence, my appreciation of the gift of God's election through His grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, is it sufficient to guide me, to correct me along the way and assure me of my salvation? I missed one word in that. Start the beginning of that sentence again. Is my... Is my... My, is it possible that my reverence, my my reverence, is that what you said? Yeah, reverence for God. Okay, His gift, that yeah. free gift yeah. He's given me. Is it? Let's say it again. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow. So no, say, it's no. Say it again. So, so is I, my reverence and is it possible that my reverence yeah. and my appreciation of this gift? Yes. A lot of people I talk to are like, well, you just right. use that as an excuse. I don't. I right. I revere the salvation. Yes. I feel that I was elected right. as a child by Christ. Right. Okay to have that relationship with him. So finish that sentence though. Is so, it what? So my, my question is, I guess, is, is basically, is it sufficient to guide me, correct me along the way and assure me of my salvation? You know, that James versus Ephesians and having clarity on that. Yeah. Well, if you look at the difference between James two and Romans four, which is what people have pitted against each other, that we're saved not by works, right? We're not justified by our works. That's the statement in Romans 4. And then in James 2, we are justified by our works. And clearly the context, these are not irreconcilable passages. It's that one, the context clearly is talking about that faith without works is dead. In other words, we are justified in the fact that we have that assurance, which is your question, because of the outworking of my faith. But before God, we're not justified by anything that we do. We're justified by his declaration, his forensic declaration that we are forgiven in Christ. And that happens at least in time by the fact that I have expressed this faith in him, that I have a, a confidence in the finished work of Christ. So I'm going to say your, your gratitude, your reverence, your, your, your valuing of the free grace of God is going to produce the things that will produce the assurance. In other words, the gratitude for the election, as you put it, of, of God's grace in your life will be the fuel for the works that you should be able to point at and say, here are the works that give me assurance. And, and I say that because that's the way it's presented to us in Scripture. In 1 John chapter 3, in particular, the whole chapter is going to tell me that the reality of my faith is proven by my changed life, the trajectory of my changed life. In chapter 1, it says of 1 John 1, none of us are without sin. If you say you're without sin, you're lying. But with chapter 3, it's saying you should see a consistent directional change in your life. And the question would be, what fuels that? And what fuels that is, what motivates that is this grace that God has given me. So it's not enough to say my reverence and my gratitude. It is the fuel, but what it does is it produces the fruit, and the fruit I look at and say, hey, good tree bears good fruit, bad tree bears bad fruit. I'm looking at the fruit, and that's giving me assurance. Assurance is a tricky concept if you think about it. It's a subjectivity to saying, I know that I know that I'm a child of God. Well, how do I know that? Well, because I'm bearing fruit. Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruits. So that needs to be present to give me assurance. But I know that the thing that's going to get me there is not doing good works to be accepted by God, but doing good works because I recognize the gratitude for his grace that produces something I can look at and say that wasn't there before. And, and, and for us as a subjective witness to those things, it's seeing them produced organically from the inside out. Anyone can conform to an external standard. What we're looking for is the change within our hearts, being a new person in Christ that changes who we are, that then drives something from the outside. And, and, and to speak of that passage, to talk about that purification process of my life, it's coming from something inside of me, this hope of the assurance of the fact that I am God's. So yes and no, it's, it's the, that's the, the catalyst for the thing that I'm going to be able to look at. You should be able to say, I know that I'm a Christian because I've responded rightly to the gospel. I can see that in my history, but I know it because the gratitude from that has produced these fruits. Yeah, that's the short answer, I guess. Hi, Pastor Mike. Hi. I uh, enjoyed getting that book from Focal Point this month, and I wondered if you agree with Ron Rhodes about the pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah, uh, I do. <laughs> yeah. Now, listen, the, the tribulational view is not the test of orthodoxy. Let me say that. But I do believe that the 70th week of Daniel, chapter 9 of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's called in the Old Testament, the time of great tribulation, tribulation, Jesus said, has never been on the face of the earth from the beginning of time until the end of time. That period of time, I believe, as it says in First Thess, is the expression of God's wrath. He's coming to the earth to express his wrath on his people. We're not destined for that. 
I think that he's moving in the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week that is determined for God's people. And, or, um, he talks to Daniel. Daniel's people and Daniel's holy city, which is Jerusalem and Israel, that God is now turning his attention back to that. As it says in Revelation, we've got 144,000 Jewish missionaries from all the 12 tribes. And I believe all of that is fulfilling the prophetic promise of the Old Testament to Israel. Therefore, I'm believing the church is going to be taken out of the way before that 70th week of Daniel, that seven-year period, the time of Jacob's trouble, the Great Tribulation. And, and I believe that. Yes, there's going to be a population of conversions, I mean, a, a propagation of the gospel during the tribulational period, uh, and the, the saints, they're called that, right? The elect in, in that period. But these are people that are being saved within the tribulational period, uh, but I believe that the church is taken out of the way. You've got, I mean, the word ecclesia, the word for church, shows up, what, I don't know, 15 times, 16 times, I think, in the first three chapters of Revelation. We don't have any mention of it from chapter 4 to chapter 19, and then you have it once at the end of the book. Uh, the church is not the focus of the book of Revelation. The nation of Israel is, and the world, of course. Uh, so, yeah, I believe in the pre-trib rapture. There's a book by Mark Hitchcock and Ed Heinsen called Can We Still Believe in the Pre-Trib Rapture? Uh, came out, I think Harvest House published it, but uh, I might recommend that book to you. It should be in our bookstore. Can I Still Believe in the Pre-Tribulational Rapture? I think is the name of that book by Heinsen and Hitchcock. Might be a good read for you. Yes. Hey, good morning, PM. Good morning. Uh, question on uh, 1 Samuel 19. It talks about when Saul tries to kill David, and then in verses 9 and 10 particularly, how the Lord sent a harmful spirit onto Saul, right. which ultimately led him to trying to kill David. Yep. It's having a difficulty understanding why a good God would send an evil or harmful spirit onto Saul, to, which ultimately leads him trying to kill David. Right. Why would God do that? And, and, and right. the theology behind that. The immediate cause right, versus the ultimate cause. We see this throughout the Bible. Right? In Job chapter 1 and 2, you see Job being decimated in his life, his family, his, his kids, his income, his home, his health, all of that being decimated by the enemy. But you look back and see how that all unfolds in the first two chapters. God is orchestrating all of this, right? In that he is allowing this all to happen to prove a point. Uh, David, if you look at Chronicles and 1 Samuel, they're depicted in two different ways when he numbers the troops. It speaks of David numbering the troops, which is completely antithetical to him trusting in the Lord like he did when he had a slingshot in his hand. And yet it says in the parallel passage that, you know, the Lord right, had, had incited him, right? So Satan incited him, the Lord has incited him. What, what's going on here? Well, God ultimately can be held responsible in the sense, not as the immediate cause, but as the God who is sovereign over all things to allow these things to happen. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, uh, Paul has a thorn in the flesh. He calls it a messenger of Satan. Well, who's causing this? Well, he just told you, Satan's causing it. Well, he says that all of this was ultimately God's plan to keep him from exalting himself, having all these revelations. So it was God, ultimately. So who's to blame for that? Well, because it's a bad thing. The immediate cause of it, of course, is the enemy, Satan. But the ultimate cause, you could say, well, this was part of God's plan. Why? Because here's what the Bible says, Romans chapter 8. Right? God works all things together for good to those that love God and are called to his purpose. God works them all together? Is God doing all this? Well, God is the God who's architected the whole thing. But the immediate cause of the bad, clearly, are the agencies here. So you can stand back and say, what's going on here? Like when Jesus says, when that tower of Siloam fell on those people, right? Do um, you think they were worse sinners than all the rest? Well, what was that all about? It's just a natural cause. Well, God ultimately in his sovereignty is behind that. Does calamity come to a city, the Bible says, without the Lord decreeing it? No, no, never does, right? God is in charge of all that. Now, I'll, we want to somehow protect God by saying, well, you know, he doesn't have anything to do with it. Well, then you've just tied God's hands in the corner and he's wringing his hands and wondering what's going to happen in this chaotic world. Well, he knows everything, Mike. He's not wringing his hands. Yeah, but he, he's, not, he's not a God powerless, right? He's a God who oversees all of this. And even in the architectural plans of human history, there's a lot of bad things in there that according to Romans 11, were all decreed ultimately for his glory. And so we recognize the immediate cause we can attribute to Satan. And the parallel passages help us sometimes because sometimes we can see the immediate cause is the enemy, but ultimately God is the cause. Uh, you know, even in the, the Babylonian captivity, Cyrus, interesting, he called, um, uh, you know, he's being called a, a Messiah, an anointed one of God, a, a pagan king, because God is using him like pawns. Habakkuk chapter one, right? The Babylonian 
uh, leaders, Nebuchadnezzar himself, even used as a, as a tool of God to do what he wanted done with Israel, right? He's responsible for that? Well, like, Satan is certainly the, according to, to Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Satan is the ultimate worker behind all these things. Well he, well, he is, but he's not the ultimate worker behind them all. God is. So that's not a satisfying answer, but if you either have a sovereign God or you don't, and if you do, then you have a God uh, who, though he can't be credited with, in, um, and with, with the actual immediate cause of, of evil, he certainly in his plan has architected this and allowed those things, and therefore you could say, God, can calamity come to a city if the Lord hadn't first decreed it? He clearly has. That's a hard question. We're always going to have that on Q&A weekend, so we've gotten it out of the way. So there we go. Yes, in the back. Hi, Fashion Week. Hi. Um, as a single woman and reading that Jesus says it's um, a sin if you even look at a woman with lust, I was just wondering, is it habitual pornography a reason for divorce biblically? And how should the church define an affair specifically? Right. Well, let's say this. Divorce, right? Is it a biblical cause for divorce? It, it would be like me talking as a physician, right? When am I allowed to amputate my arm, right? That would probably not how you'd want to pose the question, right? It's like there's a time to amputate your arm, but it's got to be a really bad situation, right? Really bad situation. Some people are just, they don't like their marriage. They don't like their spouse. They're looking for a reason to amputate this marriage, and so I'm going to say this, God hates divorce, Malachi says, so I know that this is never a good thing. The doctor should always hate cutting off your arm. You should never like that, right? And so it is that you should say, this is a severe response to a severe problem. And you can look at Matthew 19 and say, well, it says right there, you know, um, if, you, if you divorce your wife and marry another person, you're going to commit adultery, cause your ex-spouse to commit adultery, unless it's for the sake of, of adultery. Well, great, then I can, if, as long as I can find adultery there and define it somehow, then I got my ticket and, and get to get out of this marriage. I'm just saying that's the approach we often get as pastors. When can I divorce my spouse, right? And, and that's what we need to say, wait, wait, that's, that's not the approach to this. The approach should be always to reconcile, to save marriages, to reunite, to forgive, to restore. That's our job. We are pro-marriage. We want to see these marriages saved. Okay? There are situations, though, obviously, and that's one of them. Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 7, you've got passages that say, here's the situation, and it cannot be fixed, right? And the two situations there, Matthew 19, are this habitual, what we would assume in the passage would be unrepentant adultery. And I say that because you go to Hosea and see adultery, even prostitution, and if there's forgiveness and, and contrition, well, then there's, there can be reconciliation, and I would always be in favor of that. Um, and in 1 Corinthians 7, the abandonment of a non-Christian leaving a Christian spouse. And there's another passage, Paul says, let them go. You should never seek the divorce, he says, right? Because you might be the agency to see your spouse saved. But if they leave, let them go. You're called to peace. At the end of the passage, if you're in peace, the point should be you can seek to marry another, but only in the Lord. So solve the issue of spiritual foundation. So all I'm going to say is this. I just don't like the way so often we are approached as pastors to find out what it takes so I can get out of this marriage. But I am going to say it's going to be that in those terrible situations with unrepentant adultery, uh, I don't think that catching your husband, uh, you know, skimming a, a, an internet site or even mul in multiple situations looking at internet pornography uh, constitutes what Jesus had in mind in Matthew 19 for that kind of unrepentant adultery. So I think you could define that kind of adultery in a variety of ways, right? The, the Greek word, and people will point this out, is the Greek word porneia. And porneia, they say, oh, the word porn is in that. No, it is, right? Because porn is about illicit sexual behavior. That's where porn gets its name from the word porneia. But porneia has a definition, and it has to do with the abandonment of someone's marital vow to pursue another person. So all I'm saying is this. It needs to be a serious matter, I would say an unrepentant, unresponsive spouse going after another person, and are there situations where there hasn't been technical, you know, uh, there hasn't been a, I mean, I don't know, we got, I'd be careful my vocabulary here, but yeah, it, you know, had you consummated this adulterous relationship? Yeah, there I think there's a range of situations that would still say a pastor and a biblical counselor could say, this is a really, really bad case of what you see in scripture of an unrepentant, straying spouse. And, and then if a spouse came and said, could I biblically get a divorce and remarry? The answer would then be yes. Because that's the whole point. 
even in 1 Corinthians 7, it speaks of the person saying, hey, if you, just, if you want to be done, I guess you can be done, but you can't be remarried. And, and no one wants to discuss that situation because everyone wants to be free to marry someone else. And that's the weird thing about pastoral ministry. People that are married want to be single, and single people want to be married. It's a struggle in our counseling all the time. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, I can't make up your mind. But uh, the point is that uh, I think you should definitely always seek pastoral counsel. You should always lay everything out on the table, and you should always recognize God is pro-reconciliation, pro-repentance, pro-restoration. We should seek that really, really hard until we can all say, I hope with a coach or referee standing by, a pastoral biblical counselor could say, you know what, I agree with you. There's no reconciliation here possible, and you know, you'd be free to divorce and then marry another without violating Scripture. Yes. Good morning. Um, I recently had the ability to share the gospel with a coworker. Um, he thinks a little bit differently, and he's struggling with the fact that uh, accepting Christ is the way. And um, he, he determined that if you kind of go to a map, you can select the regions where people will be saved based off of where they grow up, um, like heavily Muslim areas, or even down to an island that people might not reach to share the gospel. Um, you know, I try to talk about taking God out of it, you know, kind of saying that he can't do anything is totally removing God from everything. Um, but I'm trying to figure out a way to express to him how these people can still experience Christ and accept him even though they may grow up in these certain regions. Samuel Zwimmer might be a name to look up. And I'll get back to that. Let me start with an illustration. When I share the gospel and someone starts to hit me with that, which is usually... You know, well, what about, what about them? What about them? What about the Aborigine? What about, you know, someone in the interior of wherever and Papua New Guinea, they, they don't have the gospels. Therefore, I'm not going to respond to the gospel, right? That's like the ship sinking. Here's the lifeboat. I'm showing you the way to the lifeboat. And you're going to tell me, well, there's someone up there in the crow's nest. I don't think can get here. So I'm not getting in. That's stupid, right? I mean, it just is stupid if you think about it. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about you being guilty of your sin and deserving punishment. I'm giving you right now the answer to that. There's no other name given among men by which you must be saved, and here it is. Here is the solution. Why don't you get saved with me, and I can send you to those places on that little island so that you can get them saved, right? That's what I'd want to say to them. But see, really, I think so often it's a smokescreen, and they're pushing me back because here's the thing it says in Romans chapter 1. They're suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness. They don't want to be saved. And I get that, right? I get it. You don't want someone to be the God of your life other than you, right? You might even let Jesus be your co-pilot, but you don't want him being the pilot. And that's how people think. And so often they're looking for any excuse they can get. And here's how I would start. And I do start. Usually I get someone saying things like that. And certainly in that category, I'll say, hey, if I could solve this for you, what you're asking that you're really concerned about this, you know, this person in this place that, that doesn't have a church. If I could just completely solve that problem for you, would you become a Christian today? Would you, would you become a Christian today? Would you commit your life to follow Jesus Christ? If I could just deal with that. No, let's see if I can in a minute, but can you tell me you're ready? This is really your hang up. And nine times out of 10, they say no. I'm like, well, then what, am I, what are we doing with this question? I'm, I'm ready to answer it. And that's why I started with Samuel Zwimmer, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Or even Don Richardson is another author you could look at. Um, but I don't think that's often going to get you anywhere. So the question behind the question is, right, I, I want to be let off the hook because I don't want to submit to God, and I'm hoping I can point to someone else that can't get to the lifeboat, or I don't think they can. Um, you might be surprised at the way God has reached people that you think are unreached, and Samuel Zwimmer is one, and that's an old school guy who's written on missiology. He's an anthropologist, missiologist, who's talked about these groups of people in out-of-the-way places where the gospel has taken root, and you'd never think there's any logical way the gospel could have got there. Don Richardson wrote a book called Peace Child. That's kind of dated now, too, but I would look that up, talking about the same thing. In places where you find it's more modernized in his writing about how the gospel has penetrated places uh, that anthropologists are shocked that the gospel would ever be. How did it get there? God is not, as the Bible says, left himself without testimony. 
And as often we see in Scripture, you live up to the light that you have, God is going to give you more light. And you see a lot of folks responding rightly to the light they have. What light do they have? Everyone has the light of conscience, unless they're not capable and reasoning in their minds. And they have the light of creation, assuming they're intelligible and can take in the basics of God's divine attributes through nature. With conscience and creation, the Bible says you've got enough to respond at least to, to, to God's call of saying you're a sinner and you've got a problem and you need help you need a solution, uh, then I think if you respond rightly to those things, speaking humanly now, uh, God's going to give you the, the last thing, which in chapter 2 of Romans is the Scripture. You're going to get the truth of the Scripture, whether you get it in your own language or not, in a book form, you're going to get the gospel. And right now we've got stories, and in the modern era in particular, stories that are much more easy to understand as how the gospel got there, we can trace it. But I'm not going to buy the guy who says, I'm not getting in the lifeboat because I'm really concerned about the guys, you know, in cabin 452. You know, I'm not sure if they've heard yet. So I'm saying your eternity is at stake. Get in the lifeboat. That's my short answer to that. Yeah. Um, my question is the... Um, hello, Pastor Mike. <laughs> my question Hi. is to, since we uh, concentrate so much on showing the fruit after we get saved, um, many times I hear people, well, I went to camp and got saved, truly repented, got saved. They live for God for a while, and then they live on this world as well, so they backslide. They come back and say, I didn't show the fruit, therefore I must not be saved. So they go and get saved again. I think there's some fallacy to that. Can you explain that to me? Right, because I would never describe it the way you just did. They got saved. They backslid, they got saved again. I think that you should be very careful about trying to judge the people's hearts who are telling you in the tank, you know what? I responded to the emotionalism of camp or to the pressure of my friends or you know, to some emotional worship night or whatever, and so I made a commitment or I did something, but then I you know, lived for myself, and now I'm telling you I'm saved. It can make you look at every expression of piety or response to the gospel with skepticism. But I would say you got to stand back and say, okay, I guess they're telling me their story from their perspective. And if they are, I know this about scripture, that we are his house if we are faithful. I'm quoting now Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, so I am part of God's family if I endure. So it's not I will be part of God's family if I endure, but I am part of God's family if I endure. And they're telling me I didn't endure. I had some encounter with God or the gospel, and then I walked away from it. And then now I'm telling you I'm a Christian. The fallacy is not in the gospel being preached to bear fruit, because the Bible is very clear. That's how you'll know them by their fruit, right? Paul preached repent and bear fruit in keeping with repentance. John the Baptist said, hey, repent. They said, what should we do? And he started saying, here's all the things you ought to do in response to that. So faith bears fruit. Back to James chapter 2, we were talking about at the beginning. So it's not the fault of the gospel. It's not the fault of the preaching. It's not the fault of people saying, question your faith to see if you're of the faith. Test yourself, see if you're of the faith. Uh, it really is an honest expression of people that like to think they're in with God. And any move toward God, I'm going to think, hey, maybe I, I thought I was saved. So I would... I would say, well, let's respect their testimonies uh, and let's not be overly skeptical even of this time and let's recognize that this issue of being in or thinking I'm in and not really being in is frequently addressed throughout the scripture, right? Jesus talked about the four soils. He talked about the person receiving the word with joy, right? But then the riches and cares of the world choked it all out and became unfruitful. Well, do we say, well, I don't want to hear again. You, you had your chance at being a Christian, right? No, those people get saved down the road. And they get in the tank and they say, hey, I received the word with joy at camp three years ago, but now I'm here to tell you I got it right now. See? And all I can do is trust their testimony. And I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel and saying, hey, prove your repentance by your deeds. That's a biblical thing. And you can stand back and skeptically cross your arms and say, well, I don't know. I'm not buying all this. Must be something wrong with the gospel at that church. There's not. As a matter of fact, when you start to say to people, hey, you walk an aisle once, you raise your hand at a camp. Don't tell me about some other encounter down the road, right? I think you're giving people a lot of false assurance. So I'm going to stick with preaching the gospel and calling people to bear fruit in keeping with repentance and to prove their repentance by their deeds. Those are both biblical words uh, from Acts 26, Luke chapter 6. So, uh, yeah, 
I hear you though, that happens. Because how many people do you meet on the street that say, yeah, I'm going to hell for sure, <laughs> right? I don't think there's anybody that genuinely becomes a Christian that hadn't started out thinking, well, I think I'm fine with God. And then they get convicted by the word and realize they're not. And you add church to the mix. And you're talking about people getting baptized on our platform, talking about camp. I think you brought up camp. These are church kids, right? I was a church kid. I was a president of my youth group. I, I, I learned the verses. I earned the football. I went on the summer camps. I wasn't saved. But ask me when I was 15, are you saved? Ask me when I was 12, are you saved? Of course I'm saved. Yeah. You add church to the mix of people. And people generally like to think they're good with God. You're going to have a lot of that kind of story. So we're going to hang with it. And every time they get baptized, we're going to applaud. We're not going to say they were saved and got saved again. We're going to say they thought they were saved. But now they're saying they really are. And since I can't get in their brain... I'm going to have to trust their testimony. Yeah, back in the back. Hi, Pastor Mike. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, the word social justice is everywhere, right? right? Um, we can see it in um, even among evangelical circles. Yeah. We see it in um, the book Woke Church yep. by Eric Mason. Wow. As well as... Yep. Um, uh, the, Hope you're not spending too much time reading that book. <laughs> as well as okay. the, the Dallas Statement on... Right. Social Justice, right. authored by uh, Pastor MacArthur. Right. Um, can you comment on these two publications, as well as the biblical view of social justice at the church? Right. Well, as other guys have said, even those guys, some of the guys that crafted and signed that, I don't think justice needs an adjective or a modifier. Right. Biblical justice is what we're all about. We're all about justice. The moniker social justice obviously has come to mean some things that in our minds... Uh, should never result in the book Woke Church, right? Uh, so I'm against that. I'm in favor of the statement. I understand how sometimes the statement can be used as a club and can be divisive. I'm not interested in that. That's why you haven't heard me preach in those terms. Hopefully you can look at my preaching and listen to what I'm presenting in Scripture and saying Mike believes in us acting justly and doing justice and doing what is right and biblical. Um, what I'm not into is trying to shame you for having some kind of uh, injustice in your heart when you don't know it and don't express it and you should feel guilty and the sign that you really are guilty is claiming you're not guilty in this, right? I, I don't want to be told I'm a racist or anything else if you have no evidence and the only evidence you have is that I'm of the wrong ethnic group or I am claiming I don't have it. And, and here's the thing about the whole social justice thing. In California, I sure hope in Southern California particularly, we, we have less of, of an affinity uh, to, well, I shouldn't say, I hope we're ahead of the curve on this part of it. In evangelical churches like ours that teach the Bible, I hope you're recognizing that the things that they might be dealing with in Georgia or Tennessee right now as they're figuring out where they're at in the church, they're, they're, they're kind of wrapped up in something, at least in my life, I've known nothing of growing up here in Southern California. Right? I mean, I know nothing of any kind of systemic, you know, uh, prejudicial thoughts toward people that don't have the same skin color as me. I just don't, and I never have. And I deal with people on a regular basis here that, I mean, I disciple them, I mentor them, I get to know them. I just don't see that as a general pattern here. Uh, and I don't think I can be uh, trying to do some kind of uh, uh, making amends for something that my ancestors did. Matter of fact, my dad got a free genetic kit thing and found out, I mean, he's more of Native American than he is anything else. So I should have gone to college for free now that I figure that out. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm thinking to myself, what, 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 ultimately, what does that matter? In the end, I'm just saying, I, 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 I'm not going to use anything about my ethnicity to drive wedges. In, in our church just like I would hope in every church we should get back to realizing we're all about the gospel. We are about justice. Uh, we're all about truth. We're all about righteousness. We're all about God's, God's word and holiness. But I think this has been a major distraction in a lot of churches today. I understand there's others that have a great weight of guilt in their own hearts regarding this. I, I don't have it. And I don't have it. And that's not proof that I should have it. It's that you'd have to point to something substantive. What is the problem? And you can't do it by looking at, well, I've seen your church composition, right? Stop. Just, to me, I mean, I'm about to go off on this. It's a good question. It's a great question. But <laughs> I'm just sick and tired of me being accused of something that is not true. And again, not personally. They're not coming after me. That's, I mean, I, well, now they will maybe. But I've just, um, I, yeah. 
we're reaching our community, right? The diversity in our church is going to be whatever our community is, right? I'm not sitting here trying to, to meet quotas about, you know, how many people I have from this group or that group. Everyone is welcome here to learn the word. Our issues are about biblical concerns, social justice, reparations, all that. It's not my concern. Yeah. And I hope you're reading that book just for reference <laughs> and not because you're buying into that. And I, know, I assume you're not. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Pastor Mike. Uh, hi. So my question is, there's many Bible verses which um, lead you to think that people that are dead, believers and unbelievers, are asleep. Right. And of course, there's Luke 23, 43, where Jesus says to the criminal, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Right. So I'm just wondering um, if believers that are dead are now asleep or in heaven. Right. They say that every cell in your body is um, different. I mean, they all change in progressive ways, but the substance of your body is not what it was seven years ago. You can't even find, you know, cells. This may be old data, so maybe it's more than that. In other words, here's the point. You are not your body. You are the immaterial part. You happen to exist within a body. You happen to be enmeshed in a body, encased in a body. Uh, but you are not your body. When Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, or Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, or he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I don't know which to choose. Uh, Philippians chapter 1. All of these statements are about a conscious person being somewhere else. If I die today, I'm leaving my body behind. And guess what it looks like? It looks like it, it's in repose, as they say. The body's lying in state or lying in repose. Um, and so the euphemism came up uh, and has come up in biblical times to talk about being asleep, right? Now, clearly, everything about what Jesus taught and what Paul taught talked about being wide awake when you're dead, right? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Not today, you're going to go to sleep. Or for me to die is gain because I'm going to go to sleep and I'm really tired. This is about a conscious awareness. Jesus tells a parable about the rich man and Lazarus. The day they die, their body goes in the grave and their spirit goes to be somewhere else. Their software, their consciousness, their awareness. So sleep is, is a euphemism. You might say, I don't know if people say this anymore, kick the bucket. It's a, it's, it's a bad euphemism, but it's a euphemism for dying. Right? Uh, to pass away. That's one that's very common. Right? To pass away. No one's passing anything. Right? It's a euphemism. You don't want to say you died or they died. That just seems too harsh. So we soften it with these words and they become socially acceptable. In the Bible, the socially acceptable euphemism for dying is asleep. And, and so don't think that that constitutes any foundation for the doctrine of soul sleep like many groups teach. The Adventists, the JWs, and others. Uh, I don't believe in soul sleep because I think there's too much evidence clearly in Scripture of people being awake and conscious after they die. That's what the Bible teaches. All the passages about sleeping refer to the observation of the body, which has a appearance of sleep, which is a euphemistic way to talk about, a nice way to talk about the fact that they've actually died. Yeah. In the back. Hi, Pastor Mike. Uh, Regarding Hi. church discipline and church membership, I have two questions. Yep. With uh, church discipline, um, you know, the Bible gives us a clear model of how that should be applied, but there has been conflict with church members that don't see that it's been applied as theologically accurately as it should be. So where do you see that the conflict is between the, the attendees and the way the church discipline is being applied today in our church? Right. Well, and there... then with my second question regarding church membership, Right. Should um, professing Christians that are not repentant be members of the church? And how that, if, if so, can there be a compromise? Or uh, what type of, um, will that be compromising the truth in any way? Will what compromise the truth? Uh, having non-repentant Christians as, as part quote, of unquote, the church members. Membership. Yeah, which every church has, even those that have a very formalized practice of having classes and application forms and interviews with elders or de deacons or, or whoever it might be. They've got unregenerate people carrying membership files around. Um, so the question of membership and church discipline, let's talk about church discipline. What is church discipline? Church discipline is a church looking at an unrepentant part of their church, which by the way, there's a synonym for the word member, part. That's what the word means, a part. A member of your body is a part of your body. So a part of a church, 
right? If it is in unrepentant sin, the church is supposed to confront them. And if there's no repentance, then they're supposed to, you know, to use an old Amish word, they're supposed to shun them. They're supposed to not welcome them anymore until they change their status and say, I'm no longer a Christian. I want to learn more about Christ so I can become a Christian. Or they change their behavior and they repent. Then you can welcome them back into the congregation. That's called church discipline. And we engage in church discipline here in our church. We have an unrepentant person who's a part of our church. And as a part of, their, of our church, they are in unrepentant sin. And we say to them, you're not welcome here anymore until you repent. Change your status or change your behavior. And um, so we have church discipline. The question of membership is the question of what does a church decide to do to actually say, yes, we believe that you are now a member or a part of this church. And we have a standard. A church down the street has a different standard. Another church has a different standard. But there's no, you've created, you've inserted a word the Bible doesn't insert, attendee, an attendee versus a member. Matter of fact, everyone who frequently attended a church in the first century was called a part of the church, a member of the church. And so in our church, our, our system of what we use, if you will, to be saying someone is a member of the church may be much simpler than the church you've grown up in or down the street or you can compare us to, uh, but it doesn't solve the problem of people being a part of the church that aren't saved. There's always going to be that, the wheat and the tares, Jesus said, uh, and uh, I guess it helps some people feel like, well, if we ever have to discipline them, at least they signed a paper that said in their membership class that they would let us do that, and so maybe they won't sue us. I can guarantee you this, signing the paper doesn't keep anybody from suing you when you, when you discipline them, and... Secondly, uh, there's no guidelines in the scripture to show us what we have to do to consider someone a part of our church or a member of our church. What we're going to say is the ideal member of our church is someone who has a testimony, who's committed their life to Christ. They're involved here, not just in receiving what we give them spiritually, feeding them spiritually, as the Bible puts it, um, but they are also engaged in ministry and they're contributing through their time and their effort and their talent and their gifts uh, financially. That is the member or part of our church. But if you come here regularly, and, you know, then you're a part of this church. You're a member of this church. Now, there's all kinds of standards you have to sign depending on what role you play in the church. There's classes that we have, like our Compass 101 class gets you oriented to the church. But, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just going to say, and maybe I'm sounding too defensive, but we have membership. We have people that we say are a part of our church, we care for. We have church discipline. And if you say, well, I've never heard you get up on the platform and discipline someone, well, then you haven't been around very long. Well, I shouldn't say that. You haven't been around long enough, so we don't do that very often unless it's a public figure or someone on staff or something like that, which we've done. Uh, if it's someone in a smaller circle where to you it's just a name, we'll deal with them in the circles in which they run. If they're on a worship team or if they're in a kids' ministry leadership or whatever, we'll meet and deal with that person in that setting. Uh, so, yeah, I, yeah. The standard of membership, the Bible does not give us a standard. How many forms do you have to fill out? How many pages do those forms have to be? What questions do you have to ask? What we're looking for is a regenerate membership. People, part of your church that are regenerate. That's the goal. That's the hope. They got a testimony. And uh, depending on your role in the church, you agree to a certain set of doctrinal standards. And uh, anyone who comes to the church is subject to church discipline. That's what... That's our role. That's what the Bible says. And we could discipline anyone in this church right now. We could, might do it wrongly uh, and say to you, you're not welcome to be a part of our church. And we should have good reason for it before we do it. And we're very careful about when we do choose to exercise church discipline. That's the short answer, though it didn't sound very short. Where are we? Over here now. Yeah. Hey. Hi, Pastor Mike. Hi. Um, I was wondering what you thought of Pentecost. I was told that um, if Pentecost happens now or if people claim that there's Pentecost, so like if people start speaking in tongues, mm -hmm. like other languages, that yeah. it's demonic. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure if that was true or not right. um, because I don't want to also limit God in any way. Right. But if Pentecost was only meant for that time, I just wanted to know where and how biblically, like theologically, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you do want to limit God, I'm sure, in your behavior, because I could, I could say a lot of things that someone could stand up and do in the church and blame it on God, and you'd say, no, don't do that. That's not biblical. You'd want to limit God. They could say, oh, this is a God thing. I'm doing a God thing. I'm throwing knives around. It's a God thing. And you'd say, no, no, stop. See? So there's a lot of things being claimed to be God things in the church of Corinth, and Paul says, stop. Don't do this anymore. So there's nothing wrong with limiting what people do, even though they're claiming a God label for it. Okay? As long as we know that what we're saying to limit is a biblical thing to limit. You say Pentecost. Pentecost was an Old Testament feast. It just so happens to be the time when Jesus um, sent the Spirit to, and God sent the Spirit to 
the apostles and they began to speak in foreign languages and everybody started to hear the wonderful works of God in their own language. There's three occurrences of speaking other languages that were miraculously given in the book of Acts. And the first one was at the day of Pentecost. Pentecostals, they're called, because they like to say, well, that's what we're doing. Uh, and they speak in, today, they speak in, in ecstatic utterances. And um, it doesn't look anything what it seemed to look like in the three occurrences in the book of Acts. So I would say a lot of what goes on under the banner of tongues today is not what we read about in the book of Acts. And the good news is that we'll be teaching in the book of Acts shortly, in about a month or so. We'll start in the book of Acts and get, we'll get to chapter 2 real soon and we'll walk through that in great detail. Uh, but I would say this, we certainly want to make sure that what we're affirming as a practice in our church is something that is biblical and we don't want to um, obviously prohibit anything that is biblical, but we want to make sure that what we're affirming is something that uh, is... Pro I mean, Moses, um, part of the Red Sea, right? Well, that's a biblical thing. But we're probably not going to try to have an event at the beach this afternoon to part the Red Sea. And there's reason for that, right? They got, they got their bread off the lawn every morning, manna. We're not going to send you out to get your bread off the lawn. So just because we're saying something is not a practice in this church today doesn't mean we don't believe it happened or served an important role. The question is figuring out what that role was and if it's to be affirmed as a continuing manifestation of God's spirit today or whether it had a particular role at a particular time. So we're going to walk through a lot of that in the book of Acts and we'll see it, which wasn't a satisfying answer probably, but there's my answer. Where are we at? We're right at 12.15. Okay, let's do one more real quick. So... <clears throat> I'm, uh, God has blessed us with three children, and my oldest um, has been a very spiritual son, uh, child, uh, very faith-filled, um, God-filled, but he seems to get spiritually attacked, uh, nightmares, you know, uh, where he says dark figures carve X's in his hands, and his si brothers and sisters get killed, terrible, awful things. Um, is there things that we as parents can do to combat this? And how do we know if this is spiritual? How do we know how to make this, you know, stop? Right. Well, of course, we'd like to stop all the bad things that we experience or our kids experience. And you described it as a spiritual attack. And then you ask, how do we know if it's spiritual? I would, yeah, I'd be careful about saying nightmares are spiritual attacks just because they're dark or they have a spiritual overtone to them. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily demonic attacks upon our children. So I'd be cautious about that because all you got to do is get that in the mind of our kid to freak them out even further. So every kid has nightmares. I, as a pastor, hear a lot of people that are adults that have horrible nightmares and a lot of things. And I'm not going to quickly rush to say, well, you're having a demonic attack. That's not a good thing. We'd prefer to have sweet dreams every night, everybody. But uh, we're going to try and figure out what the connection might be between the behavior and the input of your mind during the day and what you're experiencing at night. I'm assuming you're careful parents with a lot of restrictions and boundaries on your kid and what they're taking in, right? But even, you know, that cannot solve the problems, right? There's things that they're going to put together and piece together in their minds in a imaginative way that may be uh, scary and freaky and what all, you know, even though they haven't been watching, you know, uh, whatever the latest horror movies are. So be very careful about that. The Bible says, I don't know, input, which I'm sure you are. I trust you are. But the Bible says, you know, whatever's true, whatever's lovely, whatever's pure, whatever's of good repute. I, I think in Philippians 4, we've got to work hard to get our kids as well as our parents to have their minds saturated on good things. Beyond that, there's nothing I can do when I go unconscious at night to guard myself, right? I'm unconscious. But I can work really hard to fill my mind during the day on the good things. And the Bible says that that's where our mind ought to be. And I ought to make sure that I'm not anxious. I ought to be fighting anxiety. So if there's anxiety and worry that's associated with that, I certainly say we should look at the biblical mandate to try and fix that problem through the ways the Bible gives us. I would say without freaking out your child, I would definitely talk to a pastor here as parents and get more details. And I would want to learn if I were doing the counseling, what the exposure was in the kid's life. And then I would say, you know, even if it is the fact that this kid's getting an unusual amount of difficult, scary, horrific things happening in his life. Yeah, there may be some correspondence to the fact that the kid is going to be used greatly for God in some way. And I guarantee you this, as Spurgeon said, God uses very few people greatly until he hurts them badly. And, and ministry, for instance, is a very hard, painful kind of life 
this could be preparation, right? You got a guy who's going to do great things in athletics. He's going to spend a lot of torturous days in the gym. And so it could be that this is part of a spiritual training that God is allowing in his life to put him through some hard times to get him ready for some hard work. And spiritually speaking. So, I, you know, I just don't know enough to answer that question. But I would definitely say, which I'm sure, I'm assuming you're doing, is certainly guard his input. I wouldn't make much of it. Even when my wife and I would go behind closed doors and really debate something that happened in the kid's mind, we're not making, you know, the investigation with the clipboard and the collar turned up and getting my kid to think that this is as big as we may think it is. I want to make sure that we put this in perspective. They're looking at you guys as the rock, right? You guys are the perspective, the regulators, the governors of things. And so you've got to stay in control without freaking out, without seeing this as some horrible thing. And uh, I would get some help definitely to get more of the story on the table if you wanted a good pastoral advice and counsel because I just don't have enough to go on. But if it's nothing other than, yes, uncontrolled difficulties in a nighttime terrors, and yet the guy seems to be, the kid seems to be very spiritually minded, maybe it is just simply that. Because there'll be a lot of horrible things that your kid will go through if God uses him greatly in ministry.